So our next speaker needs no introduction, but boy, does he deserve one. Um, we have Dr. Paul Grossfeld, and how fortunate are we that not only is he here in this room, you know, for this week, but he makes himself available to us any time of day, you know, any day of the week when he's on vacation, when he's spending time with his lovely wife and son, and, and you know, they share him with us. And I, I regret that I didn't say this when Susan was here before, because she shares him with us. So when you think about how everyone acknowledges that, oh, when I emailed Dr. Paul, he got right back to me. Well, that's at the expense of spending time with Susan and Stefan, and he is always here for all of us, and as well as the families who aren't here, who are around the world. And just think about that for a minute. You know, we have our questions, and we're sending them to him, and he's getting back to us. And, you know, he has a full-time job <laughs> on top of, you know, a family, and he's always here for us, and he is, he is the provider extraordinaire, and I don't know where we would be without him. This group definitely wouldn't be what it is. So without further ado, Dr. Paul Grossfeld, thank you. I think a better question is, where would I be without all of you, right? So uh, it's a tremendous honor, and it amazes me how much we continue to learn. Um, Something that was brought up at the last session, which I thought was really so true, was I actually forget already which one of the moms uh, said, what was it that she said about how, like for someone like me, who's a parent of a typical child, we just don't get it. And that's so true. And I'll bet every single one of you in this room has had a friend, a family member, a loved one say something that was just terribly offensive about your having a child with Jacobson syndrome. Am I right? Raise your hand. If Craig's in the room, I know he told me a story <laughs> about that. Um, and it's true. And I'd be willing to bet your first just reaction to that is, you an idiot. How can you be so insensitive, right? But, you know, we are ignorant. And it was so true to say that if you don't have a child or a loved one with special needs or Jacobson syndrome, you really don't get it. And I have learned so much. I feel like I'm become, I've gotten as close as I can without having a child to understand what all of you experience. And so I think actually the next time, and there will be a next time, I'm sure, that you have someone ignorantly say something stupid and clueless, and I'm sure I have over the years at times inadvertently, I think they would actually appreciate it if you did take them aside and say, you know, I know you didn't mean to hurt my feelings, but you know what? That was actually very insensitive. And I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think most people would actually appreciate that because my reaction would be, wow, you know, you're right. I never stopped to think about that. So I would kind of, as a continuation of that really great panel discussion, I hope you will keep that in mind. So what I'm going to do about for the next 45 minutes is kind of something I did, I think, for the first time a few conferences ago, but with a lot of updates. And just to kind of walk you through in kind of a fun way, uh, what my experience has been like in the last 20 years is we've learned a lot more about many of the issues with an emphasis on the medical, but obviously a lot of other aspects as well. Anybody know what movie this is from? Yeah, it's my son's favorite movie. We watch this now like seven nights a week, basically. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to play this one part because it's, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Here we go. I love this scene. Our guys, 40 kind of says a lot about our research. It brings them to about there. Gentlemen, that's not acceptable. Oh, oh, so the 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 we gotta talk about power here. Whoa, whoa, guys! Man, power is everything. Man. Power is everything. Mm -hmm. Without it, they don't talk to us. They don't correct their trajectory. They don't turn the heat shield around. We gotta turn everything off. Now, they're not going to make it to re-entry. What do you mean, everything? With everything on, the LEM draws 60 amps. At that rate, in 16 hours, the batteries are dead, not 45. And so is the crew. we got to get them down to 12 amps. 
12 amps. How many? You can't run a vacuum cleaner on 12 amps, John. You got to turn off. off. Hey, we have to turn off the radars, cabin heater, instrument displays, the guidance computer, the whole smack. Whoa, guidance computer? Well, what if they need to do another burn? Gene, they won't even know which way they're pointing. The more time we talk down here, the more juice they waste up there. I've been looking at the data for the past hour. That's the deal? That's the deal. Okay, John. Then we finish the burn, we'll power down the line. Right. Now, in the meantime, we're going to have a frozen command module up there. In a couple days, we're going to have to power it up using nothing but the re-entry batteries. Never been tried before. Hell, we've never even simulated it before, Gene. Well, we're going to have to figure it out. I want people in our simulators working re-entry scenarios. I want you guys to find every engineer who designed every switch, every circuit, every transistor, and every light bulb that's up there. Then I want you to talk to the guy in the assembly line who actually built the thing. Find out how to squeeze every amp out of both of these goddamn machines. I want this mark all the way back to Earth with time to spare. We never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. Failure is not an option. I love that scene. <laughs> It reminds me of when I first started uh, doing my research. The first talk I ever gave, some of you have heard this story, I literally sat up on a chalkboard and I drew a picture, a cartoon of chromosome 11. I said, somewhere in this part of chromosome 11, there's got to be an interesting gene that's involved in heart development. And I very candidly said, I don't have a clue how we're going to do that. This was like in 1997, but I do think uh, that's been sort of my philosophy all along is that I've had a lot of naysayers, and including starting on that first time, say, you know, give it up. But, a, you know, failure is not an option for research, in my opinion. But having said that, this is a great quote that some of you might recognize. I'll just read it. I've missed more than uh, 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. That actually very succinctly wraps up what science, to a large extent, is about. Anybody know who that quote is from? Any other takers? There you go. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's a great quote. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to how we go about doing science. You can't be afraid to fail, even though you're not going to fail, if that makes sense. And so I've shown this slide before as well. Uh, it's been an odyssey, um, just like it says here. Lots of wanderings, especially when filled with notable experiences and hardships. I better put on my reading glasses. That's getting too small for me to see. So, um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of walk you through chronologically. I think a lot of interesting developments that have taken place since I started, and actually before. So, how many of you know that it was actually back in 1973? when Dr. Jakobsen, a geneticist from Denmark, reported on a family, actually, that had a balanced translocation, which included a deletion in the end of chromosome 11. And this is actually that first individual that was described back in 1973. He is now, last time I heard, which is actually a couple years ago now, uh, doing pretty well, living in a group home in Denmark, where, incidentally, you pay a lot of taxes, but you get free care for things like people with special needs who are supported for their lives, all of their lives. So I first uh, encountered my first child with Jacobson syndrome back in uh, July of 1995 during my first month of training, actually, in pediatric cardiology here in San Diego. That's Edgar, who I continue to follow this many years later. Uh, that picture on your right was taken back in, I think, December when I last saw him in my cardiology clinic. So uh, quite a lot has happened since that first time I met him. So just a little personal history of how I became involved. There were very, very few people back then studying Jacobson syndrome. It turned out one group had been here in San Diego, uh, a clinical group who at that time re uh, published the first or the highest number of people with Jacobson syndrome doing what we call a genotype phenotype analysis. And so they published a report on 17 people. And they hooked me up with about the only PhD researcher in the world at the time. Uh, who was studying Jacobson syndrome, trying to understand the genetic mechanisms underlying what actually causes the deletion. How many of you know Chris Jones? Probably not too many. Uh, so Chris, again, is this extremely bright, talented PhD human molecular geneticist uh, who 
because of the frustrations of not being able to get funding, is now uh, the owner and operator of a little microbrewery in uh, England. But he's applying all his genetics and biochemistry knowledge and making a really good beer, so you might want to try that <laughs> if you're ever in Papworth, England, just north of London. So uh, with that, I actually, shortly into my research training in 1998, uh, spent three months in England working in Chris's lab, like 24-7 for three months. And it was during that time that I met this lady, Annette Van Bitu, uh, who at that time was the head of the European Chromosome 11 group. And it was during that first conference that was held uh, in Holland that I met, in addition to Annette, the Barretts, who unfortunately can't be here this week, but send everyone their absolutely best wishes, and the Ziegler's, who some of you may know, uh, who are from Denmark, who unfortunately lost their daughter a few years ago. Uh, and then I met Teresa Matina at that same meeting. Uh, Teresa was back then and still is one of the few other clini uh, clinical people working on Jacobson syndrome as a clinical geneticist. And unfortunately, she was hoping to be here but had to cancel out at the last minute due to some politics back home in Italy with her medical school. I also met at that same time uh, the person that some of you may know of, Dr. Remy Favier, who is a pediatric hematologist in Paris who, who works at the hospital for which Paris Trousseau is named. And it was really Dr. Favier, Favier and his colleagues who have done all the really important work that has led to some of the life-saving interventions that all of you are probably aware of about your children and bleeding. And then I think if I'm remembering, the, remembering this correctly, on my way back home from that three-month stand in Europe, I stopped in Virginia and got the chance to meet Melanie Johnson, who was the founding president of this group, and that was back in the spring of 1998. So one thing led to another, and a few months later, it was 20 years ago, I can't believe that, to the day that we held our first conference here in San Diego, just up the road in Del Mar, uh, and I think we had about 35 families. I'm going to guess, were anybody, was anybody in this room at that conference? The Maldonados. Anybody else? Yeah. The Henneberries. Were you guys in that? Yeah. All right. So we go back 20 years. Isn't that amazing? Tristan, you look am amazed. <laughs> yes, I am that old. <laughs> All right. You too. Um, and then along the way, there have been some really amazing developments that have really uh, catapulted some of the advances. So in 2001, the first human genome sequence was published. Anybody, of you, any of you know who actually funded that project? Which branch of the government funded that project? It was not the NIH. It was actually the Department of Energy. I have no idea how they pulled that off. I don't know what DNA has to do with energy, but anyway. Um, and that cost about $3 billion, and that project took over 10 years from the beginning to publish the first human genome sequence. Well, we actually have a very important part of that history here in San Diego because we have one of the very few genomics institutes here at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego, thanks to an $80 million donation by Mr. Rady. And just a few months ago, they set the Guinness Book of World's Records record for sequencing a human genome. Anybody want to make a guess for how long it took them to sequence and get back the results? Make a guess. It was 10 years the first go. All right. Yeah, you must have cheated and looked this up. Anyway, 19 hours, which is pretty extraordinary. And now they talk about the $1,000 genome, meaning it's like a routine lab test. I mean, how many of you had like a rhinoprobe scent or you know, respiratory panel? That takes three days. We get 23,000 genes and everything else back now in 24 hours, potentially. So it's just unbelievable. And then, so I spent the rest of my fellowship and beyond really learning everything as much as I can about Jacobson syndrome, the clinical aspects, and trying to correlate that with the differences in the deletion sizes. And so we published this paper in 2004 that probably a number of you are familiar with now, uh, reporting over 100, or 110 cases. And so to this, day, to this day, that's been the largest study, which I think a lot of people have hopefully found to be pretty useful. Um, in 2004, I met this family. Any of you guys know this family? Who I was actually... Uh, their daughter had actually been diagnosed with autism 
because uh, if anything, your children, in my experience, seem very outgoing, more social and in your face, and autism kind of went against that perception, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, as many of you already know. Leading up to what we know now, shortly after that, is when doctors Matson and Achimov, who many of you have met, joined forces with me to very systematically and prospectively study the behavioral and cognitive aspects of Jacobson syndrome, and you'll hear more about that later on. As an aside, this was my own genetics project that came to fruition. Uh, you met Stefan. How things have changed. <laughs> One thing that, uh, another thing that's become incredibly powerful is uh, something called array CGH or array comparative genomic hybridization. This actually originated in the last millennium. Learn, uh, it was a technique used to identify changes in the DNA in tumors, in cancer tumors. And that technology evolved to where it is today, where we now use this routinely to identify the exact breakpoint of your child's deletion or potentially duplication or both. So that now has become a first-line clinical diagnostic tool for anyone that's suspected of having what we call a uh, duplication or deletion disorder. So you can imagine now that the combination of that technology along with the Human Genome Sequencing Project allows us now for any one of your children to get, give us a specific exact readout of what genes are or are not deleted. And as you'll hear about later on in the conference, that information can be very, very important in terms of potential prognosis, potentially, and even some potential therapies, which we're going to talk about uh, a lot more tomorrow. Um, and then taking, using these technologies, we were able to hone in on the gene that we found is now the cause of the heart defects in about half of your children. Half of your children have a heart defect, and it's due to this gene called ETS1 or ETS1. And then uh, shortly after that, we published our first paper identifying two genes that we think contribute, can contribute to some of the cognitive and maybe behavioral problems that your children have. And you're going to hear a lot more about that as well tomorrow. So uh, he's not at this conference, but many of you in the past got to know Chuck Haymeyer, who is this incredibly brilliant attorney who advocates for children like yours with special needs. And Chuck has this special area of expertise in medical protocols. And so thanks to Chuck, who graciously donated his time to work with us to generate this bleeding protocol that many of you now hopefully are using, which is a medical legal document that empowers you to leverage your child's medical teams to make sure they are on top of the bleeding issues that your children are at risk for. How many of you are familiar with this protocol? Or let me ask you this. And I'm not saying this just in a critical way, but how many of you are not familiar with this bleeding protocol? Don't be shy. So it's on the 11Q website. Um, and I would ask you to familiarize yourself with that like yesterday. And what you can do is actually make sure that your children's local caretakers in terms of uh, primary care people and even their, your local children's hospital has that in their medical record. And then there is no wiggle room for them to not uh, adhere to the recommendations that are very specifically outlined in that. OK. Um, then in about 2011, it was my colleague here in San Diego, Hal Hoffman, who many of you have heard at previous conferences, who alerted me to a new development. And that is with this neonatal screening program that had been implemented in several states. How many states now, um, Ken? Where? Wow, that's incredible because it started out with what? Just a handful, right? Five. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an incredible achievement. And what Hal told me was that there were, through this initial uh, part of the screening program in several states, uh, several children, infants that tested positive for. Uh, immunodeficiency that had Jacobson syndrome. And that was really a first time that we were alerted to the possibility that your children could be at risk for very significant life-threatening infections. And really, coincidentally, right around that same time, tragically, there was a toddler on the East Coast who I learned died from complications from what's typically a cold virus in us, but can be a very, very serious infection infection. 
in a young child or even worse in a child that's medically fragile and immunocompromised. And so uh, I think Ken and Virgil remember this, and for those of you that were here back at the 2012 meeting, what was supposed to be, I think, an hour talk ended up going about three hours as uh, we learn from all of you sharing your experiences about the kinds of infections that your children have had. And uh, with that, I think that really kind of formalized our collaboration and our effort to learn as much as we can. And thanks to these two, uh, nothing's changed. They still drink beer um, <laughs> and enjoy life. But uh, I think that's going to be my introduction for you guys after my talk. But um, they have done some really great, great work, uh, which you're going to hear a lot more about just in a few minutes. And then... Uh, for those of you that are geeks like me and like to follow who wins the Nobel Prizes in various uh, areas, this was a very significant award given in 2012 to two uh, scientists. One on your left, Dr. Gurdon, who I remember learning about when I was in college, uh, who showed that if you take the nucleus of a skin cell from a frog and transplant that back into a uh, frog egg cell, in which you remove the original nucleus, that even though that nucleus came from this very specialized skin cell, that now transplanted into an egg cell could still develop into a normal frog, meaning all that genetic potential in a very specialized, differentiated skin cell is retained to be able to drive normal development of an organism. So that was actually back in the 1960s. Uh, Dr. Gurdon's from England. I think he looks like Chris Jones, actually. <laughs> but, uh, and then many, many years later, about in the last 10 or 12 years, Dr. Yamanaka actually identified four genetic factors that can mediate that whole process to basically de-differentiate a cell into what we call a pluripotent stem cell that can then be reprogrammed into a new cell. And we're going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow. And it has incredible implications because what this allows you to do is create what we refer to as disease in a dish, where we can actually recapitulate from the patient the disease process. And I'm going to tell you how we're learning about heart development from some of your children, actually, using this technology. And with that, uh, we have made iPS cells now from three children with Jacobson syndrome, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that uh, actually later on today. Um, in 2014, uh, now that whole genome sequencing has become much more commonplace, particularly in the research arena and more so even in the clinical arena, there was a nice paper published that uh, did whole genome sequencing on several hundred patients with, very, uh, with a whole variety of congenital heart defects. And interestingly, one such patient with a very complex congenital heart defect was found to have not a deletion, but just a, what we call a single, basically a single base pair or point mutation in the same ETS1 gene. And so that was further proof that we were really on the right track, that the ETS1 gene is the cause of the heart defects in Jacobson syndrome and potentially in others that don't have the deletion and all the other fact, uh, issues that go along with Jacobson syndrome. And then thanks to uh, Sarah and Natasha, we uh, formally studied some of your children to determine whether or not they had the features of autism. And this paper came out in 2014, showing that, in fact, overall about half of your children, which was a pretty extraordinary number, uh, two-thirds of males and about one-third of females, fulfill the diagnostic criteria for autism. So half, which is pretty uh, impressive. I'm just curious, how many of your children have been formally diagnosed with autism, if you want to share that information? So a fair number. Okay, um, something that's become pretty humbling uh, is, uh, I think it was two conferences ago I gave a talk on this and what the leading causes of mortality have been in Jacobson syndrome, which comes up not uncommonly. And I guess the good side of it is thanks to things like the work that our immunology colleagues have done and the work that Dr. Favier and others have done, I think with awareness and knowledge we've begun to make a difference in minimizing catastrophes relating to bleeding and infectious problems. But for sure now, the number one cause of death in children and adults with Jacobson syndrome is congenital heart disease and specifically hypoplastic left heart syndrome. 
I think probably a lot of you are, may remember just a couple months ago, we had a three-week period where we lost three children, and all three of those children actually had hypoplastic left heart syndrome, so uh, very sobering experience. Now, in 2014, I have a collaborator at Caltech who coincidentally had been studying this same gene. She's a PhD biologist, and uh, as, so we have kind of hooked up since then, and it was really interesting because she was working on how this gene is involved in the development of various organ systems, including the heart and the frog. And I'll tell you more about that later on today. But was actually, she asked me to look at her manuscript. She's a PhD, so she doesn't have the clinical background, but I took one look at her pictures of her frog hearts, and I said, my goodness, this is exactly what you would predict for what hypoplastic left heart syndrome would look like in a frog. And I know that sounds like a big deal, but actually it is a big deal because one of the huge limiting problems in the research in the area of hypoplastic left heart syndrome is there's never been a genetic model in an animal to study. And without that, you're really, really limited because you can't look at what the earliest steps are to try to understand the mechanism and to try to come up with ways to maybe improve the treatment or maybe even prevent it. Moving along in time, then just a couple years ago, three years ago, uh, Virgil and his colleagues from Holland published this paper, which was a report on, I think, six patients, right, Virgil? Um, showing, I think, as I recall, five out of the six had very significant uh, varying degrees of immunodeficiency, and you'll hear a lot more about that momentarily. But that was really huge, because that, in a very systematic way, confirmed the suspicions that, was, that were raised just a year or two before that at our conference that it really was quite prevalent. And then uh, this is actually a fascinating uh, publication that came out through a new collaboration that I established a few years ago with the only group in the world that happened to be studying the gene that we implicated as at least one cause of autism in your children. And you're going to hear a lot more again about that tomorrow which I will just cut to the chase and tell you, uh, is leading to what we think may be a medical therapy for your children that have autism, maybe. And then in 2016, uh, many of you probably know Sophia, who was part of a trial, who uh, was being treated at the time for autism, at which time it was not known that she had Jacobson syndrome. But what came out of that was that the medicine that they were using, buspirone, actually may help with some of the intellectual disability problems. And again, you'll hear about that tomorrow. So even though we didn't know a specific gene, it raised the possibility that there could be medical therapies that can help your children. And then uh, just a couple of years ago, we went many years uh, without hearing too much, with the exception of Kara here in the group who had suffered a stroke. And so I only knew of one other child back in our first conference in 1998. And then how long ago did I first meet you guys? What year was that? 2010. So one case in 98, one case in 2010. And that was the only time I had ever heard of anybody with Jacobson syndrome having a brain hemorrhage. And then all of a sudden, there were like four or five more cases over the ensuing several years. And so several of those cases were actually uh, children in Europe. And so Nigel Barrett was really one of the people who brought that to our attention. And so we, thanks to many people like you and the families in Europe, uh, worked with us to try to learn as much as we could. And so we published this paper just this past year as a retrospective study describing these uh, situations, what exactly happened, and have now come up with hopefully some meaningful recommendations to identify who of your children might be at risk for having a catastrophic brain hemorrhage. Um, and then, again, thanks to the work of uh, Ken and Virgil and Chuck Haymeyer, similar to the bleeding protocol just this past year, we have now implemented an immunology protocol. And again, that is available on the 11Q USA website to download, so same exact rationale. And I think without stealing their thunder, it certainly behooves all of you, if your children haven't had a comprehensive immune evaluation to do that. And this should, from a medical legal standpoint, empower you to be able to do that. So that should be very important. And this is one of my former postdoctoral fellows in my lab, who is now back in China, who actually uh, took the initiative after leaving my lab, studying the ETS1 gene for its role in heart development, has actually now discovered that this same gene is actually the cause of 
the 10% or so of your children that have been born with structural kidney defects. And so that kind of opens up a whole new field. And it's actually quite interesting because there is a precedent for how one gene can cause both heart and kidney defects, interestingly. This is a young man that you're going to meet tomorrow. They're flying in tonight, actually, uh, who is a very interesting, very sweet boy, sweet family, uh, who is very historical uh, for Jacobson syndrome. And he is the first patient that we have treated uh, with the known deletion of the gene for autism for which we are treating with a drug that specifically targets that gene. And that drug is called clonazepam, and you're going to hear all about that tomorrow and hear the results so far that we have uh, on how he's doing. So I told you about this whole field of iPS cells, so how we can take skin biopsy samples from any patient for anything you're interested in studying and reprogramming that into any cell that you're interested in. And again, I'll talk about this later on today, but what is actually really exciting now is that we have taken iPS cells from three people with uh, very complex heart defects and mutations in the S1 gene, and we've reprogrammed those uh, uh, cells into now one of the lineages that's critical for heart development, which I'll talk about later on today, called the neural crest. And I'll show you later on this afternoon how those results uh, support what we've actually been learning in the animal models and how we may be able to use that system potentially to prevent this kind of heart defect in the future. So that, I think, is very exciting. And similarly, uh, literally tomorrow, uh, one of the people here at this conference is going to be started on a medication that specifically targets the gene that we have identified as the cause of the more significant intellectual disability in those children that have the larger deletion. So that's another historical step forward, in my opinion, that we are all very excited about. And the beauty of these couple of examples that I told you, three examples actually, is that we didn't have to go back to the drawing board to develop a new drug. We're actually doing something called repurposing, meaning we don't have to go through all the obstacles of safety and, you know, it's estimated every new drug development costs $800 million. We're actually taking a drug that's already been approved by the FDA and we're repurposing it for a new application. So I really hope you guys will come to that talk tomorrow. I think, at least for me, it's going to be fascinating. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but suffice it to say that thanks to you guys and the support and cooperation that you've given, we have a lot of exciting stories coming out. Uh, I think we're going to have close to half a dozen new publications submitted or have already been submitted or will be submitted this year. Um, so stay tuned. And I'll obviously keep you updated. And uh, this is just a little summary of kind of where we come from and where we're going. Uh, from 1973 to the present, there have been, I hope I'm reading this right, 124 patients, uh, excuse me, papers published. But in the first 24 years, only 12. There have been more than that just uh, published in the last two years, so in one-tenth the time as many papers. Uh, from 1998, which is about the time that I started doing Jacobson Syndrome, there have been 113 papers published, and I've been involved in a good number of those. Uh, I won't bore you with all the other statistics, but suffice it to say that I think uh, there's been increasing awareness now and recognition of Jacobson Syndrome in the medical and research world, and it's becoming relevant. So um, moving forward, one of the challenges that I find uh, is, despite all this incredible research, uh, I think there's been a problem, and we can talk about this maybe in a different forum, maybe over drinks or maybe uh, during the business meeting on Thursday, but how do we make this information accessible, particularly to new families? So I try to read every so often some of the Facebook postings, and I have to say, I always kind of shake my head when every so often I'll see, and I don't mean this in any offensive way, but it's enlightening to me to see people that will ask, has anybody known about your child having a bleeding problem? Or does anybody know about Jacobson syndrome having behavioral problems? And so I think one of the things that we need to do is more effectively disseminate that information. The downside is it does kind of put the onus on you, the parents and the families, to educate yourself. But I think in the final analysis, that information is valuable and worth the effort. So um, 
I think we need to, you know, again, Lindsay, maybe on Thursday we can bring this up and have people make some suggestions about how we can make this. Oh, I see you have a plan in place. Good. Anyway, so that's it for a little history. But um, again, I want to thank all of you because obviously none of what I've just talked about and none of what you're going to hear in the next couple of days would be possible without all of you, both from your cooperation in terms of actually participating in these studies. In the past several conferences, we were literally taking punch biopsies out of your poor kids' arms to get skin samples, which sounds pretty drastic. But um, also, and we'll talk about this more on Thursday, so many of you have been so passionate about helping me and my, through my desperate appeals to get the financial support to keep this research going. And again, uh, the la this presentation would have been one blank slide if it weren't for you guys, so thank you again. <laughs> I'll be happy to take any questions. If not, how are we doing for time? Right on? Yeah? Okay. Thanks. <laughs>